On September 2, 2022, Eliza Fletcher, a mother of two and a teacher in Memphis, woke up early and went for a jog. She went along her regular path near the University of Memphis, but her whereabouts remain unknown after that. The 34-year-old was seen abducted and shoved into an SUV in a surveillance footage. Her body was discovered three days later near an abandoned structure with her jogging shoes nearby. On September 2, 2022, at about 4.20 a.m., Fletcher, known to her family and friends as Liza, was out for her usual morning jog when the abduction happened. The mother of two was seen on camera running near the University of Memphis campus while sporting a purple running short and a pink jogging top. Before turning up, the footage showed a black 2013 GMC Terrain SUV traversing a pasture. Then, a man was observed exiting it and rushing aggressively in the direction of the jogger. The individual then forcefully placed Fletcher in the passenger side of the vehicle following a violent altercation. The video then shows the automobile leaving the site after the two were inside for almost four minutes. When Fletcher didn't come home after her jog, her family filed a missing persons report. At the scene of kidnapping, her water bottle and cell phone were found, a pair of champion slide shoes that were left behind in the altercation and are thought to belong to Henderson were also discovered by the investigators. To aid in the search for the missing mother of two, images of the suspected car were made public. The same SUV was seen on surveillance film, prowling the area where Fletcher was taken only 24 minutes before to the kidnapping. Days were spent by law enforcement investigating parks, ponds, and dumpsters in the vicinity of Fletcher's disappearance. Three days after her disappearance, on September 5, 2022, just after 5 p.m., authorities in South Memphis discovered the victim's body next to an abandoned elementary school building. The heinous discovery was made less than a mile from where a witness reported seeing Henderson vigorously cleaning an SUV that matched the vehicle seen in surveillance footage. It was also close to Henderson's brother's house, where police had pulled over a dumpster and retrieved bags as evidence. On September 6, 2022, Police revealed that the body had been positively identified as that of the mother of two. Affidavit from federal, state, and Memphis Police Department investigators stated that they had observed car tracks in the tall grass that led to an abandoned building. A search and rescue worker noticed a decaying scent and spotted some footprints on the property's back driveway. The documents claim that he then noticed a female who was unconscious and lying on the ground. Right there, they declared her as deceased. Fletcher's purple running shorts were discovered by the police in a nearby garbage bag. Additionally, a shell casing was found in the vicinity. Between 5.48 and 5.52 in the morning, surveillance footage showed Henderson's black GMC terrain in the vicinity. After the autopsy, it was discovered that Fletcher had been shot in the back of her head from a distance that was unknown and had sustained blunt force injuries to her right leg. Two semicircular defects in the skull are consistent with a single gunshot wound to the head, with the bullet going from right to left, posterior to anterior, and rear to front. She additionally suffered fractures to her jaw, the report stated. A car that fit the suspect's description was seen by U.S. Marshals in a parking area near Henderson's residence. The SUV's damaged taillight and partially obscured license plate were identical to those seen in the kidnapping surveillance footage. Henderson attempted to escape when police saw him close by, but on September 3, 2022, just two days before the teacher's body was discovered and 24 hours after she was kidnapped, he was taken into custody to be questioned. Memphis police charged him with aggravated kidnapping and tampering with evidence on September 4, 2022. Henderson was charged with three more counts of identity theft, theft of property under $1,000, and fraudulent use of a credit card by Memphis police the following afternoon. Following the kidnapping, Henderson had been observed cleaning the inside of his car and washing his clothes in the sink. 
Witnesses and the suspect's brother reported seeing him acting strangely at home and carrying out the cleaning later on September 2, 2022. Despite the authorities' claims to the contrary, they have found blood and other evidence in the car, which makes them think Fletcher was seriously injured. The champion slides discovered at the scene were linked to Henderson by DNA evidence and surveillance footage, and cell phone location data also identified Henderson as being at the scene of the kidnapping. Henderson allegedly declined to provide detectives with information on Fletcher's whereabouts and what had happened to her. Henderson was charged with first-degree murder and first-degree murder in connection with the kidnapping after police discovered her body. On September 6, 2022, he made his first court appearance after being initially detained on a $500,000 bond. On September 7, 2022, Henderson appeared in Shelby County Circuit Court a second time. This time, a judge revoked his bond. He requested to be addressed as Cleotha Henderson rather than Cleotha Abston throughout this appearance. He was listed as Cleotha Henderson in Shelby County Jail documents following the court appearance. After the police searched their home, Mario Abston, the brother of the suspect, was also taken into custody and prosecuted. Mario Abston faced charges of felony firearm possession, one count of possessing heroin with the intent to distribute, and one count of possessing fentanyl with the intent to distribute. Before the kidnapping and murder of Fletcher, Henderson, 38 years old at the time, had a lengthy criminal record. He was known to be a member of the Lemoyne Gardens gangster gang and had been in the juvenile system from the age of 11. He was arrested 16 times between 1995 and May 2000 on charges of theft, serious violence, unlawful possession of a firearm, and rape of a man when he was 14 years old. He kidnapped a man at gunpoint when he was 16. Less than two years before Fletcher was killed, he was freed from prison after being found guilty. Similar to the abduction of Fletcher, early in the morning Henderson, then 16, forced a Memphis lawyer into his car. Around 2 in the morning on May 24, 2000, Henderson drove up to Camper Durant, got out, and pushed the lawyer into the car's trunk. After spending several hours driving the victim around, he took him to an ATM where he robbed him. When the victim shouted out to a bystander for assistance, his attacker left the scene, saving his life. Henderson was later taken into custody and entered a guilty plea to aggravated kidnapping in 2001. After serving 19 of the 24 years he was sentenced to, he was freed in November 2020. One year prior to Fletcher's kidnapping and death, and one year following his release, a lady was allegedly raped by Henderson in September 2021. According to Alicia Franklin, she scheduled a dinner date with Henderson after they met on a dating app in 2021. After blindfolding her, holding her at gunpoint, and threatening to murder her, the suspect led her to his car. After that, he allegedly forced her into the car's back seat, where he assaulted her. Mrs. Franklin called the police to report the assault, but because the rape kit took a while to process, Henderson was not taken into custody at the time. Henderson's DNA was already in the system from his previous convictions, but it wasn't until September 5, 2021, that her purported rapist DNA was added to the National Law Enforcement Database. Henderson is currently facing additional charges related to the 2021 rape, which occurred three days after Fletcher was abducted. In addition, he is accused of robbing someone on September 1, 2021, the day before Fletcher was kidnapped. Henderson entered a guilty plea to each allegation. Eli Weaver, who referred to himself as an Amish stud on online dating services, had multiple encounters with women he met through these sites before, to his wife's murder in June 2009. However, only one lady had the willingness to take a life on his behalf. At first glance, Barbara Weaver's life as an Amish housewife would have appeared to be idyllic. She was 30 years old, had been married to Eli for 10 years, and the couple lived in the affluent traditional neighborhood of Apple Creek, Ohio, with their five young children. But when Barbara was discovered shot dead in her own house on June 2, 2009, 
All the evidence pointed to Eli Weaver as the perpetrator. The Weavers were members of a conservative fraction of the old order Amish. They were forbidden by their religion from using cell phones, the internet, or even taking pictures of themselves. They rode horses and buggies throughout the town. But upon further examination of the Weaver family's life, investigators discovered Eli didn't quite follow those guidelines. He had multiple extramarital relationships with different women, the majority of whom he met in an online chat room where he introduced himself as an Amish stud, in addition to having a covert cell phone. His profile stated, Who wants to do an Amish guy? Eli Weaver and Barbara seemed to have a happy marriage at first glance. They lived in a friendly and well-established neighborhood. Barbara was an outgoing, gregarious person. Although quite pleasant, she had a relaxed demeanor, a kind spirit. As Mary Eicher, a neighbor, described herself, Eli was an outgoing person. He would frequently approach quite late in the evening to request a ride. Additionally, he was quite considerate and would say sorry for the interruption. There was charm about him. As a Mennonite taxi driver, Mary would transport the Amish residents of her town to locations that were inaccessible by horse and buggy. Nevertheless, the Weavers' marital troubles started in their later years. Eli was having multiple affairs and withholding money from Barbara. Barbara's sister, Fanny Troyer, stated, Eli wouldn't even give her money to buy groceries or take care of the kids. She said, Eli ran a gun store and business was good. It wasn't about the money. It was about control. Barbara was allegedly physically abused by Eli in front of the Weaver children, but she never reported it since. In the words of one Amish leader, she would have been asked, What did you do that your husband would treat you like this? Barbara was having trouble with her marriage. She wrote her counselor a note. Where has my dependable, loving, and friendly husband disappeared to? He despises me completely now. Twice, Eli Weaver even abandoned his family and the church to live as an Englishman. On both occasions, he returned a few months later pleading for forgiveness. In the Apple Creek settlement, there was another Mennonite cab driver named Barbara Raber. In 2003, Barbara was 33 years old, and Eli was 23 when they first met. They started having an affair. Throughout the months preceding the homicide, Weaver had requested multiple individuals to assassinate his spouse. Although he was not taken seriously by most, he said in his testimony that Barbara ran off with the notion when he brought it up to her. In the autumn of 2008, they began to plan the murder. Investigators discovered a pattern of text between Weaver and Barbara that addressed the method of murder after Barbara conducted 840 internet searches on poisoning. I thought she might not detect it if we could get that fly poison stuff and a spice cupcake, Barbara stated in a text message. Eli replied to her, Maybe you could blow up the house. What about your children? She questioned. To which Weaver said, The children will go to heaven because they are innocent. They ultimately decided to use a gun. But why was Eli Weaver obliged to murder his spouse? Why didn't he just walk out on her? Weaver's lawyer, Andrew Hyde, pointed out he would have been shunned if he had left. They give him a backpat after his wife has passed away. On June 2, 2009, early in the morning, one of the Weaver children discovered their mother dead and covered in blood in her bed and hurried to the neighbor's house to get assistance. It was discovered by investigators that Barbara Weaver had been shot with a .410 shotgun. The bedroom held a large amount of cash. Thus, robbery was not the reason for it. Eli Weaver was fishing on Lake Erie with pals when Barbara was found. He had left at three in the morning. Barbara Raber, who lacked an alibi, was the person who the family's acquaintances and neighbors directed the police toward. Barbara alleged to have entered the Weaver home at 4.30 a.m. on the day of the murder, taking a gun from her husband's gun cabinet. She claimed the revolver inadvertently discharged and that she didn't remember loading it saying she just intended to scare Barbara Weaver. Eli confessed to plotting to kill his wife with Barbara Raber on June 10th, a little more than a week after Barbara Weaver was killed. In return for testifying against Raber, who was accused of murder, 
he entered a guilty plea to conspiracy for committing murder. Weaver testified that he and Raber had discussed the plan the day before, the murder. The trial started in September 2009. He informed her that the basement door would be kept open for her when he left for a fishing expedition at three in the morning. Contradicting her earlier account, Raber said she had never been in the Weaver residence. Raber's prints were not in the residence, and the murder weapon was never located. Barbara was killed, according to Raber's lawyer, by Eli Weaver, who allegedly shot her before heading out on his fishing expedition. On June 9th, however, Weaver stated in his testimony he had met Raber in his barn. He added that Raber gave him a detailed account of the murder and expressed her regret for everything, according to Weaver. Robber asked him how to clean a gun so it wouldn't look like it had been fired recently. Weaver's testimony proved crucial in Robber's conviction and subsequent 23-year-to-life sentence. Weaver's plea agreement included a sentence of 15 years to life. Weaver will be eligible for parole next year, while Raber will not be eligible until 2032. Barbara Weaver wrote in one of her last letters to her counselor, I often think of Christ's words, Forgive him, for he knows not what he does. The terrifying inspiration for the movie Alpha Dog came from the events that transpired in 2000, when drug traffickers abducted Nicholas Markowitz and spent days partying with him, before ultimately killing him outside of Santa Barbara. Nicholas Markowitz was a passionate reader and theater enthusiast in high school. Benjamin, his older half-brother, ran with an amateur gang of wannabe tough guys that used to sell ecstasy and marijuana. Even though their parents attempted to keep Nick safe from those crooked forces, they came for him. That shady underbelly of the West Hills neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley was home to impressionable youth and high school dropouts, and at the center of it was Jesse James Hollywood, a man with the demeanor of a bully and a reputation of an outlaw, who handled the drug deals and always collected his debts. Unfortunately, Ben Markowitz owed $1,200 to Hollywood at the time when he started to distance himself. Frustrated that he couldn't wrangle Ben back into the fold and determined to save his reputation, Hollywood kidnapped Nick Markowitz on August 6, 2000 to force his brother's compensation. Nevertheless, Hollywood took extreme measures and had the 15-year-old killed upon realizing that abduction could result in him being imprisoned. Although he was aware that his former acquaintances enjoyed a tough talk, he never imagined that they could go this far. I never thought that this would have happened, even in my worst nightmares, he remarked. In Los Angeles, California, on September 19, 1984, Nicholas Samuel Markowitz was born. He spent most days walking, hanging out with his elder brother, and getting ready to earn his driver's license during the summer before his sophomore year at El Camino Real High School. However, on August 6, 2000, at 1 p.m., he was kidnapped when he slipped out of his house to avoid a confrontation with his parents, Jeff and Susan. Jesse James Hollywood, a fellow West Hills resident, was from a wealthy background. Despite being a standout baseball player in high school, he was expelled in his second year. After a subsequent injury crushed the 20-year-old dropout's hopes of becoming an athlete, he started selling narcotics. His amateur crew included former schoolmates such as 20-year-old William Skidmore, 21-year-old Jesse Rugg, and 21-year-old Benjamin Markowitz, who were still in debt to him. After a mere year as a dealer, Hollywood went to pick up his money from Ben, only to stumble upon Nick strolling along the road. With the help of Rugg and Skidmore, Hollywood pulled over his van and forced Nicholas Markowitz inside. Using the license plate, a neighbor reported the incident to 911, but the police were unable to locate the vehicle. Markowitz's pager, wallet, Valium, and weed had been seized, and he was restrained with duct tape. Markowitz was moved about between different residences over the course of the following two days, but he was assured he would be released soon. He played video games, smoked and drank with his captors at Rugg's Santa Barbara house, 
Even Markowitz attended their parties, where he became friends with Graham Presley, a 17-year-old boy. Presley stated, He told me it was okay because he was doing it for his brother, adding that he was just concerned about his brother's well-being. Markowitz even denied an offer to run when Presley drove him around town, indicating that he didn't want to complicate what appeared to be a minor problem. Hollywood even assured Rugg that Markowitz would be free soon enough, leading to a Lemon Tree Motel pool party on August 8th. Rugg said to Markowitz that evening, I'm going to take you home. I'll put you on a greyhound. I'm going to get you home. Unbeknownst to his mates, Hollywood had discussed a possible kidnapping charge with his family lawyer and had become extremely paranoid about it. After reaching to the conclusion that killing Nicholas Markowitz was the sole option available to him, he asked Rugg to perform the nasty deed for him. After Rugg turned down the offer, Ryan Hoyt, 21 years old at the time, was contacted by Hollywood. We have a small issue, Hollywood stated. That's how you're going to pay off your debt. You're going to handle it for me. Similar to Ben Markowitz, Hoyt owes money to Hollywood. Hollywood handed him a semi-automatic gun upon his arrival and promised to clear his debt with an extra $400 reward if he killed Markowitz. Hoyt and Ruggie duct-taped Markowitz's mouth and hands early on that night. In the wee hours of August 9th, they took Presley along and drove Markowitz to the Lizard's Mouth route near Santa Barbara. Twelve miles away, in a rundown campsite near Moat, they walked the scared teenager to a shallow grave. Hoyt shoveled him over the head, threw him into the hole, and fired nine shots at him. After covering his burial with branches and earth, they took off by car. Following the discovery of Nicholas Markowitz's body by hikers on August 12th, numerous individuals who had gotten to know him while he was a captive came forward. Within a week, Ruggie, Hoyt, and Presley were taken into custody by the police. Hollywood ran away to Colorado but he wasn't found until August 23rd. He remained a wanted man for over six years before being apprehended in Rio de Janeiro in 2005. By tracking his father's phone calls, police were able to track him down using the alias Michael Costa Giroux. Despite his family and friends painting a positive image of him during the trial, he received a lifelong imprisonment. Hoyt received a death sentence after being found guilty of first-degree murder. Ruggie served 11 years in prison after being found guilty of kidnapping, while Skidmore received a nine-year sentence after entering into a plea agreement. Presley spent eight years in a juvenile facility since he was underage at the time. It has taken over 25 years to unravel the rape and brutal murder of an elderly woman who was discovered stabbed to death in her San Diego, California home. Klein Sorga was found dead in her residence at 5600 Gain Street, close to Linda Vista Road, on February 29, 1992. The day before the murder, Hetty, who spoke to her mother every day to see how she was doing, had talked to her. The next morning, on February 29, Hetty tried to reach out to her mother three times, yet she got no response from her. According to San Diego Police Chief Shelley Zimmerman, she felt something was off. Hetty rushed to the house where her mother lived. As she saw the blinds shuttered and the garage's light on, she knew something was off. As she walked into the house, she discovered her mother's lifeless body on the floor right next to her bed. Klein Sorga was assaulted and had suffered multiple stab wounds to her neck as well. Investigators claim that the murderer attacked Kleinsorge after breaking into her house through a window. The murder of Kleinsorge remained unanswered for many years. Regular DNA testing, according to the authority at the time, did not match anyone in a statewide offender database. 1907 saw the birth of Kleinsorge in Germany. After coming to the U.S., she met Paul, her husband, there. Later relocating to California, the couple opened a landscaping company and reared their family in a modest house in the peaceful Linda Vista neighborhood of San Diego. The pair endeavored to contribute to their community while living the American dream. At the International Villas in Balboa Park, 
The Kleinsorge family was one of the founding members of the House of Germany. According to the police chief, they were very proud of their German-American lineage. In 1971, Paul passed away. Angela Kleinsorg stayed in the family's house and became accustomed to a tranquil existence as she got older. She watched soap operas, worked in her yard, and got up at 6 a.m. every day for coffee and breakfast. Her kids, relatives, and friends all adored her. 2017 saw the significant breakthrough in the 25-year-old cold case involving the 84-year-old Angela Kleinsorg, according to San Diego law enforcement. Based on DNA testing, authorities have determined that her killer was Jeffrey Falls, a guy who lived across the street from the victim. Hetty Kleinsorga, the victim's daughter, stated that they were devastated to find out that the culprit had been a neighbor. Though Falls is no longer alive and had passed away in an accident in 2006. Nevertheless, San Diego law enforcement was able to identify him as the murderer, thanks to a unique process called familial DNA testing. When this kind of cutting edge science entered the picture in July 2016, the cold case finally started to come together. A request for familial DNA testing, a procedure that enables detectives to examine criminal databases more broadly, was included in the 2015's cold case, submittal from the San Diego Police Department and District Attorney's Office to the Department of Justice. Through the procedure, investigators could pinpoint those who are most likely to be close family members of a potential criminal. According to the DA's office, the familial DNA results of this case matched a convicted but deceased perpetrator. The findings indicated that there was a good chance that the person who killed Kleinsorg was that convict's brother. Researchers looking into this breakdown in the case have learned that the killer had two brothers, Falls, 42, who passed away in a motorbike accident in 2006, and one sibling who was still living. After the living brother's DNA was tested by San Diego Police Department officers, he was ruled out as a suspect in the unsolved cold case. It was time to test Falls after that. According to the DA's office, tissue samples from Falls were sent to Adam Dutra, a San Diego PD lab criminalist. From Falls' tissue, the police lab was able to get a partial DNA profile. At this moment, the discovery, which had been building for almost 25 years, came to pass. According to the DA's office, Fall was identified as Kleinsorg's killer when his DNA was found to match a sample taken at the scene of the murder. There is a quadrillion-fold chance ratio of kinship between the crime scene sample and falls. At the press conference, San Diego County District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis declared that the case had finally been solved. District Attorney Dumanis stated, The familial DNA testing results have brought some measure of closure to the Kleinsorg family. Despite being an uncommon practice, Bonnie praised the science for its ability to advance an investigation and solve more crimes. Hedy, the living daughter of Kleinsorg, talked about what that meant for her family. Hedy was devastated for a long time by her mother's death. She added that when someone you love loses their life in a brutal manner and no one is prosecuted, you frequently wonder if the murderer thinks about what he did when he wakes up the next morning. After 25 years, we finally have our answer. Even if there is still a gap in our closure, at least we know that Mr. Falls no longer believes he got away with the assault and murder of our mother. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of unsolved cases.